Uh, my name is Brian Lenny. I'm the editor of Junior Stock Review Premium. Uh, today I'll be presenting focus on the risks that are controllable. So first, a presentation agenda. Uh, I want to recap the five ways I think you can be more successful and consistent investor. Uh, why self-awareness is so important. Uh, three investor archetypes, three introspective questions you can ask yourself, and then putting it all together, and a couple words about my newsletter. So five ways you can be more successful and consistent investor. And for those of you that didn't see the June presentation at uh, Metals Investor Forum in Toronto, um, I went through five ways I think you can be you can be a better investor in the resource sector. Uh, those five points were self-awareness, price to value ratio, markets are impossible to predict, sell price, and rules to invest by. Basically, I think if you implement these, these five things, you will absolutely be a better investor in this sector. And in particular, I think self-awareness is where you need to start. And that's kind of what I'm gonna talk about today. So why is self-awareness so important? Um, it's definitely a good question. You know, a lot of the stuff you probably heard yesterday and maybe even later today, it's going to focus on all the risks, you know, the external risks, whether it's the Fed's interest rate decision, um, civil unrest, you know, in Europe and around the world due to inflation and a whole bunch of other factors, COVID lockdowns, all these things do have uh, or are a risk to your portfolio and do have an effect on your portfolio. Um, but for the most part, I think they're uncontrollable. There's nothing that any one of us can do to impact whether Jerome Powell raises or pivots the interest rates, uh, even though it will have an effect on our portfolio. Um, so I think you need to focus on something that you can actually control, and that's how you participate in the market. And that's why self-awareness is so important. So self-awareness breaks down into a number of different aspects. I think you need to ask yourself a few questions. First, your knowledge level. Uh, you know, the junior resource sector, you need, uh, well, somewhat of a baseline in geology balance sheets, capital markets, metallurgy and mineral processing. You don't need to be an expert in any one of these things, but you do need a baseline knowledge. And considering that a Google search can bring up a plethora of information, um, I don't think there's any excuse for not doing some reading and getting a background on, on how to look at companies and understanding how they're pitching you. Next is risk tolerance. The, the sector is really is a spectrum of risk. On the one end, you have the exploration companies that are very much high risk, you know, high reward. And on the opposite end, you have the low risk royalty and producers. And in the middle is the developers. And you know, again, it depends on the company where they land on that spectrum. But you need to understand that there is risk in, on a spectrum and where your risk tolerance lays. Unfortunately, I think a lot of people end up having to lose money first and realize, hey, you know what, I don't like that. And I shouldn't have been invested in a high risk exploration company. And you know, my, my uh, suggestion is that you contemplate this first and adjust your portfolio accordingly. Um, next, we have duration of investment. So when you come up with an investment thesis, you're gonna have a number of catalysts that you think that are, the market is gonna see and it's gonna recognize that the company has successfully completed them and then recognize the value in the company. And then hence the share price goes up. And you're gonna have a duration for this, these catalysts to be complete. What you'll notice is in a bull market, that duration condenses. And it doesn't even mean that the company necessarily completed those actions uh, successfully, but uh, a bull market is, is quite an amazing thing to be a part of because it does condense everything. Um, vice versa, you get into a bear market where we are today, the company is completing actions, everything is going really well, and the share price is staying flat or it's going down, and it can be really disheartening. And really, my suggestion here is, you know, you got to put a duration for that investment, but you do not want to get knocked out in a market like this if the company is successfully moving forward. And, uh, but you need to have that mentality first and not get shaken out in markets like this. How much time will I dedicate to due diligence? I would say most of the people here today probably have another nine to five job. They're not looking at junior resource companies every day like I do. Uh, as such, I don't think you can carry 30, 40, 50, I've heard 60 companies in a portfolio. To me, this is not only way too diversified, uh, but there's no way you can do the research to buy 60 companies and then track them, in my view. Um, and then one question that I'm going to add this week, and it's what type of investor are you? How are you participating in the market today? And I think if you're honest with yourself, you need to answer this question, and this is how you can be better. So I, I've made three investor archetypes. 
the adaptive investor, the shrewd investor, and the diligent investor. And basically, this is almost like risk. There's a spectrum here. At one end, you have adaptive investors. The other end, you have shrewd. And somewhere in the middle, you have the diligent investor. And I'll talk about what each one is. Um, also, a couple of really good quotes. First one's from Peter Drucker. Uh, History's great achievers, Napoleon, Da Vinci, Mozart, have all managed themselves. And that, in large measure, is what has made them great achievers. And then one by Howard Marks. One of the great things is to understand ourselves. And without that, we're really in trouble. And I think they're great quotes there. So first, the adaptive investor. Uh, the adaptive investor bases investment decisions on emotions. Um, sensations, the urge to act now for profit. It's the quintessential FOMO. Um, you know, often the mindset is impulsive and susceptible to narratives, and usually narratives that are focused around high metal prices or the success of a company is a given. And unfortunately, I think <laughs> most of the market is made up of adaptive investors, highly emotional and you know, very impulsive with uh, impulsive reactions to marketing. And I used, there's a meme that I thought was funny. <laughs> the Desecchi's guys, I don't always buy at all-time highs, but when I do, I go full FOMO. And uh, Rick Rule's great quote, have a hunch, bet a bunch. And these are great examples of the adaptive investor and how they uh, react in the market. So if adaptive investor is on the right side of the spectrum, the shrewd investor is on the far left and is very much left-brained. Uh, they use a quantitative approach to, or fact-based approach to investments. Um, this, and I think, you know, if I were to pick one extreme or the other, I think you can make money as a shrewd investor, but you definitely won't be optimized. There's going to be things that you miss, uh, such a, and you can be prone to being greedy. Uh, I think rigidly black and white, there's no gray, and you don't necessarily, or you aren't necessarily able to understand narratives and their impact on the market. And uh, the last one, you may be a poor judge of people. And obviously, in a people-driven biz business, it's, it's troublesome. Again, so you don't want to be on those, those two ends of the spectrum. The diligent investor. Uh, the diligent investor uses a framework for decision-making. They integrate both the quantitative and the qualitative side of an investment. Uh, so they don't function at those extremes. And they're able to be level-headed and not let emotion take over their investment decisions. And that this increases the probability of success over the long haul. So I don't think anybody is necessarily the diligent investor, or nobody is necessarily any one of these three. But you do probably lay somewhere on that spectrum, and it's where your tendencies are. So the question is, what type of investor am I? And this is, you have to look in the mirror and be honest with yourself. So what I've done is I've put together a few questions and then I'm gonna go over kind of like a multiple choice answer. So the first question, I'm interested in buying a junior company that's exploring Quebec. I do a Google search and find five companies that are exploring the Abitibi Greenstone Belt. I don't know much about any of them, but I recognize the CEO of one of the companies. He speaks at all the conferences and I see his company advertised in all the mining podcasts. Hey, I buy the company I'm familiar with. These guys are everywhere. They must have a good track record. I'm going to roll the dice. So to me, this is the adaptive investor. It illustrates the familiarity and impulsiveness. And outside of what they've heard in marketing, um, they really know little, very little about the company. B, I take my time. I investigate each company thoroughly. Promotion is needed in the junior sector, but it can't be everything. I will buy the company that best fits my investment criteria. To me, this is the diligent investor. Um, they have a process that they go through. They understand, you know, the risk tolerance, duration of investment, all those factors I talked about earlier. And that's what goes into which company they pick. C, buy all five companies. One of them will be successful and pay for my mistakes I'll, that I make with the others. It's a bull market, baby. Um, this, is the <laughs> this is the adaptive investor. Uh, you know, a bull market is obviously skewed, you know, uh, their perspective on the market. They've been lucky, or again, another Rick Rulism, uh, they've confused a bull market with brains. And this can, <laughs> this can be very uh, troublesome, and it will catch up to you at some point. And remember, this is all cyclical, so you, it's, and it's especially, uh, like for me, for instance, my personal experience, I started in a bull market and absolutely made these mistakes. And I paid for them, but I learned from them. And I'm just trying to suggest to you that you learn from them before you make the mistake. Save yourself some money. So D, uh, I can't decide. And this shows the person is risk adverse. And honestly, I don't think this is the worst decision on this page. 
Uh, I think if, you, if you're that risk adverse and you, you, you don't know what you're doing, your money probably should be left in the bank and you'll be, you'll be able to sleep at night and be that much better off. But that's again, it's an introspective question you need to, to answer yourself. Question two, I've had three major investment failures over the last three months. In each case, the exploration companies that I invested in uh, missed and now I'm down 50%. A, I realize exploration is high risk and because of that, I don't allocate a large percent of my portfolio to any one exploration company. Thus, while losing money is never good, I was prepared for this. To me, this is the diligent investor. You know, they have good perspective on the market. They know exploration is high risk. They're okay with that because the, the reward is high. And they've adjusted the, port, the size of that position according to the, the percentage of their portfolio. B, I'm devastated. I sell the rest of my positions and cash out the rest of my money that I have left. I come to the conclusion that it's impossible to make money in the junior resource sector. To me, this is the adaptive investor, and you can feel the emotion in the reaction. Um, you know, first off, I think they're ignorant to the, the risk that's in expiration. You know, the odds are that the company is going to miss. Um, and obviously, they haven't done a lot of work prior to making that investment, and thus they're left in this kind of emotional overload. <clears throat> C, I'm never investing in expiration companies again. And really, this is a vague statement, uh, but what I think it does you know, bring to focus is the person lost the money, but they reflected on it and they say, you know what, that's not for me. And I think at the very least, <laughs> that's what you need to realize is when you make mistakes or you're in a, in a certain type of company and you realize you lost money, you don't like it, it doesn't fit you, you got to not make that same mistake again. So reflection is key and I think that's, that's something to keep in mind. But I didn't classify it as green because, you know, the mistake was still made without reflection prior to the investment and I think that's what you want to avoid. D, I'm doubling down. The companies will hit on the next drill program. I believe in them. Plus, these things always come back, right? This is the adaptive investor, uh, putting more, more money into a company based on hope rather than a uh, solid thesis, I think is the recipe for disaster. Question three, I've created a list of rules by which I want to invest by. The list includes a rule which says I must sell the stock once my target price has been hit. Uh, provided no new catalysts exist that could take the share price higher. I follow my rule and sell the stock for 30% profit, but the stock continues to move up. A, I get angry. I'm missing out on more profit. I contemplate buying back in. And to me, this is the adaptive investor. They did well by making up a rule, uh, but then they have this emotional response because they see the share price going up after they've sold and followed the rule, a rule that made them money. Um, and then they contemplate buying, contemplate buying back in. This, again, is the adaptive investor through and through, and they probably did buy back in and then probably lost money. B, I get frustrated. This always happens. Of course, when I sell, the share price goes up, and I'm going to decide to delete that rule from my list. Again, the rule made you money, and then your emotional response is, well, I'm going to delete it because it didn't work in this scenario. You need to reflect, if you, if you decide to do a rules-based approach to your investing, you need to reflect on rules and make sure they optimize to how you want to operate in the market. Um, but deleting a rule that made you money seems counterintuitive to me. C, I recognize that because of this rule, I've missed out on profit a few times now. I decide to take another look at my analysis and see what I could have missed in my evaluation. And to me, this is the diligent uh, investor. A rule is made to be scrutinized and you want it to optimally fit how you want to operate in the market and, and maybe show you where you miss something. D, I recognize my limits in terms of predicting market movements and I'm satisfied with the 30% gain. Working within the limits of my system allow me to cons be consistent no matter what type of market is present. And now I mark this as the shrewd investor. Um, I think that if, if the statement said that I reflected on, on, on the missed profit, um, then I think it would be more towards the diligent investor, but I still kept it green because I think that no matter what, and this is how I think a shrewd investor can make money in the sector, because that rule did protect them. They're okay that they missed the rest of that, that move in the share price, and they can move on to their next thing. And, and to me, that's the correct way to do it. So putting it all together, first, you need to be honest with yourself. Um, you know, if you lie to yourself and how you're operating in the market, you're not going to be able to make any improvements. 
Second, I highly suggest keeping a journal. This is something I did, especially when I left my full-time job to be an investor. I needed a framework for decision-making to keep myself consistent and you know, honest to myself. And the best part about it is you can look back on why you thought a share price was gonna go up. And if it did, you did a good job. And if it didn't, you can see where you went wrong and possibly fix it. Two books that I would highly suggest, Managing Oneself by Peter Drucker and Seeking Wisdom by Peter Bevelin. And then the second part is once you've got number one figured out, go back to, to points two to five, especially point number five, rules to invest by. And this is really where I think you can make the difference in protecting yourself against yourself. And then finally, don't expect perfection. You know, the, the idea is to have more wins than losses. Uh, no one's ever gonna be perfect, and, uh, but it's, you know, you can definitely strive for it. Uh, the two picks presenting with me today, Aztec Minerals, they just closed a deal uh, to gain 100% of their Cervantes project with Kootenai Silver, great deal. Uh, Cervantes has some great highlights this year, headlined, you know, the gram and a half over 136 meters. It's a world-class hole. Uh, and then they've also had this strategic investment by Almost Gold. Uh, $3 million to obtain 9.9%. We've got Nucor Gold, they've got the Enchi project in Ghana. Great economics, PEA after tax MPV over 300 million US. Low CapEx, this is an oxide gold project, a uh, million and a half ounces. They just finished a 90,000 meter drill program. What's interesting about that is 70,000 of those meters weren't included in this economic study. In my view, there's a lot of room for improvement here and it's already a very attractive uh, uh, economics. So I, I think Nucor is, is a very good investment at this point, and they're a top M&A candidate, you know, considering all of those points. Junior Stock Review Premium, uh, it's published weekly, my market comments, portfolio review videos, company rankings, um, ask any of the subscriber questions, and I usually answer those in, in video format. Uh, some big winners over the last couple of years, and the Diligent Speculator, for the people that sign up for the yearly, they get access to the Diligent Speculator video series. It's a set of modules um, that, with baseline information, kind of what you need to you know, have a good understanding or a good base for investment in the sector. If you guys have any questions, you can get me at juniorstockreview at gmail.com. Thank you very much.